2011, I went to the British Museum in London to see a collection of medieval artifacts. And these included gold coins and pieces of jewelry that had been found in England in 1966. And among the pieces of jewelry, I was particularly attracted to the heart-shaped brooch that you see before you. I asked the medieval curator who was accompanying me when that particular heart shape had first appeared. And he said uh, that it was common by the end of the 14th century. So from that moment on, the figure of the heart pursued me. And it ended up in my writing a book called The Amorous Heart. I began the research for that book with two questions. The first, when and under what circumstances was the heart shape invented? And the second, how long has the heart been associated with love? It turned out that the second question was much easier to answer than the first question. So I'll start with the second question and come to the first question later. I discovered that the association between the heart and love had been a around a long time. In fact, as far back as ancient Egypt. And in ancient Greece, poets, philosophers, physicians all agreed that love was lodged in the heart. Venus, it was believed, incited people to fall in love. And she did that with the aid of her son, Cupid, whose arrows never missed the mark. But the Romans also had a curious belief. And that was that there was a vein extending from the fourth finger of the left hand directly to the heart. They called that the vena amores. And because of this, the fourth finger would have the honor of wearing the wedding ring. This idea held on, even though it was based upon incorrect knowledge of anatomy. Uh, in the medieval period in Salisbury, England, during the church ceremony, in the liturgy, the groom was instructed to place a ring on the bride's fourth finger because from thence there was a vein that led directly to the heart and inward affection. So today, wearing a wedding ring on your fourth finger goes back to the Romans through the medieval liturgy until our own time. It was in the Middle Ages that the heart and love became associated very strongly in the poetry and songs of the troubadour in southern France, in Provence, and in the minstrels of northern France. And the heart was given a very special place because that is what you pledged to your lover. First of all, the heart had been understood as the home of love. Also, it had certain religious connotations that I won't enter into today. It was also the home of the soul. But long before the heart icon was invented in the Middle Ages, that particular figure, that particular shape had existed without being associated to the heart and without being associated to love. And this is what I call the non-heart heart. And I'll show you a few examples. What you see before you certainly looks like our familiar heart icon. But in fact, 
It is on a coin from the fifth century BC in, and it is intended to represent a sylphium seed. Sylphium was a, an old, now extinct form of fennel. Why in the world would ancient Egypt, uh, Libyans put this seed pod or seed on a coin? Well, it turns out that sylphium was known for its contraceptive properties. And the, the Libyans, the ancient Libyans, got very rich from exporting silphium throughout the known world. And they honored it by putting it on one of their coins. So only a very circuitous relationship with love. Another example of what I found came from Persia in the sixth century. And you see that row of what we would call hearts. But the figures on this drinking vessel show women musicians and dancers. And those women are surrounded by grapes and vine leaves. And the decorative non-heart hearts probably were inspired by leaves and probably had nothing to do with the heart. And here is another example from manuscripts of the late 9th century, 10th century. And they were from a commentary on the apocalypse written by a Spanish monk known as Beatus. So what do you see on that horse, who is one of the horses, one of the four horses of the apocalypse? Well, <laughs> a decorative figure. And there is no reason to believe that it had anything to do with the heart or love. So stop for a minute and ask yourself, what would have happened to this figure if it had become associated with Silphium, it may have become a brand for contraception. And if it had been associated with wine, it might have become a brand for wine or winemakers. And if it had been associated with the four horses of the apocalypse, it may have become a brand for horses. I mean, certainly the double lobes do suggest haunches but it didn't become any of those things. So we have to go to the 12th, 13th, and 14th century when the ideas of courtly love were circulating in Europe. And there we see the development of the idea of pledging one's heart, and in fact, of giving one's heart to the lover. Here you can see one of the first examples of the heart offering, which was already known in the medieval period through song and story. But if you look at that heart, it looks more like a pine cone or an eggplant or a pear. And that's because Galen in the second century had described the heart as shaped like a pine cone. And that hung on right through the mi Middle Ages. The person on his knees, he's called Sweet Looks in a work of literature, French, called The Romance of the Pear. That person is offering a heart to the standing lady. The heart doesn't happen to be his. He's only a messenger. He's offering it to her. Uh, for safekeeping, and she's not even the woman to whom, for whom the heart is ultimately intended. But what interests us here is the iconography, because that's one of the first examples of a heart offering, and it is in the shape of a pine cone. That same shape can be found in a religious work, and in several religious works, this one from Giotto's version of caritas, charity, or love, and she is offering her heart to God. 
You may not think that's a heart in her hand, but it is. And if you could see it closer, you, would, you could see aorta coming out from the bottom. This was a very, very fertile period in the development of the heart icon. It took about 100 years, from about 1250 to 1350. And Italians in the north of Italy were experimenting uh, on different versions of the heart. This is one by a, a little known writer and miniaturist called Francesco da Barbarino. You see Cupid atop a horse with the darts in his hands. And what do you see around the neck of the horse? Wow, hearts. Rudimentary lobes to be sure, but lobes. And here is a partial version of the bilobed pointed heart that will become so familiar to us. Cupid is racing off in triumph with the hearts he has pierced. And here's another, also by Giotto, uh, version of the heart, less positive than some of the earlier ones because you've got Cupid with a bandolier across his naked body, hearts hanging by their stems, and Cupid is blindfolded. That means love is blind, foolish, irrational, so not a very positive picture of love. And now we are going to move on back to France because the Italians did not paint very positive images of secular love. They did paint beautiful religious paintings of love. We have to return to France for the first indubitable heart icon with two lobes and a point. And this comes from a French manuscript around, well, the date is 1344, because the Flemish painter, miniaturist, signed it. His name was Jean de Grise, and he signed it uh, with the date 1344. Uh, the woman is accepting the heart offered to her by the kneeling man who is pointing to his chest as the place from which it has come. From this moment on, 1344, there is an explosion of heart images, uh, particularly in France, but then in Northern Italy and throughout Europe. Uh, the image that you saw at the beginning of this talk is only one of many, ivory carvings, tapestries, weavings, uh, pendants, and it is an image that we cherish in our own time. And it continues to evolve in Valentine's, emoji, and of course the, well, it has become a verb. I heart New York. And I suspect that that image will continue to evolve in unknown ways in the centuries to come. Thank you. <laughs>